Hi everyone, I'm hoping we are live. I believe we are. I'm just checking on my phone to check. Otherwise, I won't be. Yeah, I am. Fantastic. Awesome. So welcome everyone to my live on traveling safely with dogs. My name is Helen. And um, I just want to start this off by saying and reiterating again, that I'm not affiliated with any company. This is just um, a live to help you make an informed decision about how best to um, sort of work out what you need for your um car your van um, and make an informed decision and i'll be looking at the pros and cons of sort of crates and harnesses and there's no one that's actually better and you know this is often a mistake um that i see people saying you know one-on-one group so i'm not affiliated with anyone um i will i'd really love to sit you know hear your comments um post pictures of your dogs please do um any businesses that are or anyone sharing a business name about um a crate or a harness will have their comment deleted um just because i want to make sure this is completely neutral and that there is no um you know affiliation with there at all so let me just i'm going to just start actually i should go back i just want to sh check that my screen is sh shares okay because you know what things are like so i'm going to start sharing i'm going to share my screen my presentation and we will be good so there is always a little bit of delay I may get joined by my cat, Holly, who is staring out the window in front of me. Um, Bambi is by my side. He's had a little bit of fame. Um, he's been in a few live videos and now he just wants to, you know, be live all the time. So it's a crazy world. OK, brilliant. Here we go. So I'll just present that and check it's all OK. And then I can start. I think I just keep looking at my phone. So I think it's OK. Looks like it's OK. Awesome. OK, so welcome to Travelling Safely with Dogs or Cats, actually, because my cat Paddington, before he passed away, used to travel all the time. Um, so let's turn that off on Facebook. OK, so Travelling Safely uh, with Dogs. Um, it, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about me and about my background. Um, it is a bit of a minefield, this whole subject. Um, and it's probably going to ask you, leave you with more questions. But what I want you to be have the knowledge of is um knowing the questions that you need to ask okay and the pros and cons i'm going to be telling you the don'ts give you a few things to think about we're going to be looking at travel safe crash safe and within those two areas we're looking at harnesses and crates and then we're going to look at post crash safety as well and then just look at how it's a balance and this is two of my dogs maz and bambi on the isle of mull um out for a, a little walk we had a lovely time there and looking forward to going back so a little bit about me um I have six dogs. Um, you can see them there. Bambi's on wheels, uh, rescue from Romania. Then I have Maz, who's a two-legged dog from Afghanistan, the, the one in the top centre. Um, Inca, my blind dog from Romania. And then there's Seren Spaniel, who's canny crossing with um, Inca there. She was her uh, guide dog when we were doing uh, canny cross events, which hopefully we'll be back doing again. And then there's me, um, Rowan and Evie um, competing at, I think that was... The new forest but i might be wrong it was somewhere muddy anyway i can tell you that um and canny cross is my sport before i did canny cross i was really into flyball so i've spent a lot of years traveling around um in my what started off as a land drive with an awning out the back and then graduated to a caravan and now i have um, a camper van and you know traveling with my dogs so i work as an a e doctor at a major trauma center we specialize in penetrating trauma um, so that's anything that penetrates the body. So it might be a bullet, it might be a knife, it could be the steering wheel of a car. Um, before I became a doctor, I did two degrees, one in aerospace engineering and one in impact and explosion engineering. And they both covered a lot about obviously structural integrity of vehicles and buildings, as you can imagine, and also um, about sort of crash safety and also looking at the body as well. And then particularly the impact and explosion engineering, we did a lot of um, sort of research into crash worthiness and explosion worthiness because you know in in some cases a crash is an, is an explosion and in some cases it is it's far more of a, an explosion as well um and so we looked at all those different factors um my dissertation for my master's was in the fluid and solid modeling of giant intracranial aneurysms which is how i got interested in medicine and I was trying to develop a code for a, a computer program that would predict rupture rates um so um 
it, that's sort of a bit about me. And prior to that, actually, when I was doing um, my uh, prior to my degrees and when I was doing my aerospace engineering, I was also working as a flight attendant for Virgin Atlantic. So safety is something that um, I did that for seven years. So safety is something that's been um, sort of in the forefront of my mind for a very, very long time. OK, so it is a minefield. Um, air law car safety anything on the road is all very much retrospective you know we've all heard of cars being recalled because a fault's been found laws are found you know laws are developed highway codes being developed it wasn't actually till the 50s that there was proper um sort of investigation and data collection really into crash safety and you know in the 30s they felt that no one would survive a, a car accident and certainly there was no you know safety features um, crash safety started off with using human cadavers um, and then they did actually sadly go to animal experiments and I think that went on till about the 90s and, and pigs typically uh, were anaesthetized and put in the front of cars because they could best replicate the human body. The problem with using um, anything like a cadaver or an animal um, that's anaesthetized and also the dummies is we are dynamic beings and so we don't act the same you know and it, it only takes a slight variation to produce a really different effect, a catastrophic effect. Um, these are sort of the um, crash test dummies. Um, they've evolved over the years, uh, different hybrids. They're, you know, started off with just sort of, you know, the movable limbs. They have sensors in them. They're very technical. Um, but they do still obviously have their drawbacks um, and they're constantly being developed as well. Now, you can't obviously plan for everything everything and you know a dummy <clears throat> how <clears throat> excuse me however amazing they are designed they still can't um sort of totally and utterly predict how a human will behave because they're not a dynamic being um now we obviously because of crash testing and because of what happens in real life we have various safety features in our vehicles but there's always risks and benefits associated with them so i have seen quite bad injuries associated with a seatbelt but i'm never going to tell you to not wear a seatbelt because the chances of um the the risk of wearing a seatbelt is much smaller than the benefit to someone wearing a seatbelt. And it's the same with airbags. Airbags can cause problems, especially, I mean, this is why they say about airbags with children in the front, you've got to disable your airbag um, because again, that can cause catastrophic injuries for your child. And the same with your dog as well. If you have them in the front with an airbag, you, you need to disable it. <laughs> um, you know, and people do come in as well with burns from airbags and things like that, but they do still save lives. So it is always a balance of risk versus benefit. Um, there's there's no with, for dogs and safety. There is no standard. There is no ind independent testing. Um, there are some facilities, but there is a pecuniary interest because companies have to pay to have their um, product tested. So there is always that element of is it truly independent? And there's no standard. There are no anthropomorphic dogs like dummies. <clears throat> what they tend to do is use a weighted, like a toy that's weighted down, but that does not behave in the same way that a dog would do. And when I've actually watched some of these um, crash tested videos, um, you know, the dog being flung forward um, in a crash, a dummy dog is not behaving the same way a dog would do. There's no mo movement of its neck. There's no movement of its limbs. So it's not, you know, what it can tell you is how far forward that dog will move. But it's not really accurate in telling you whether or not how, you know, that dog could potentially be injured by the uh, the harness or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, as we know, dogs come in all shapes and sizes. You know, a, a something like a dachshund, a long backed dog um, could behave very differently in a crash to something like a Labrador. <clears throat> and not just because of the size, but because of the actual um, sort of shape of their body. Now, as far as I know, <clears throat> sorry, I just have a green drink of water. Now, as far as I know, there has been no testing of a dummy dog in a crate. Um, and this again is, is a problem because we don't know how a dog would behave in a crate that was in a crash, how injured it would be. Um, you know, it's not hard to imagine, you know, a car going at 50 miles an hour, hitting something, and then the dog being flung against the bars of the crate. How injured is that dog gonna be? As far as I know, there's no tests. Um, I did sort of do a good search of all the available um, information when, before I did this presentation. Um, and again, I've, I've come up with no um, information regarding that. 
cars themselves come in all shapes and sizes as well. So it does make it really difficult. Um, harnesses are generally tested at um, approximately 30 miles an hour. You could argue that the risk of injury at that speed um, is significantly reduced, um, you know, certainly within humans. That's not to say <clears throat> it's not going to be, um, you know, there's not going to be big injuries, but, you know, you, there's no information. How is that harness going to cope at 40 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, 60, 70 on a motorway and a far higher generated um, impact than sort of tootling around town? Crates generally are for owners to fit themselves, which is a problem as well, because is the owner fitting them um, like the, produ um, the person who produced the crate, the developer intended them to be fitted? It only takes a slight change in how they've tightened a bolt or a strap for that crate not to perform the way that it was tested. Crates themselves have only been tested at 40 or 50 miles an hour and generally only in one type of car. So, again, that causes, you know, how would they perform in a car with less structural integrity? How would they perform um, at a greater speed? Any harness is only as good as its weakest link. So something ideally without buckles and good um, uh, sort of stitching and made out of a good material. So there is a few harnesses that have like seatbelt material, um, but it's all to, again to do with the stitching and buckles. So I have a, I have a combination of harnesses that have buckles and um, you know no buckles, and you know I consider them really really good. <clears throat> um, and bespoke crates. You know how much investigation has been done into their crash safety. You know when you put them into a vehicle, it does change. It can change um, how that vehicle responds in the event of a crash. You know um, how qualified is the person who's done that bespoke crate in uh, looking at impact and you know what happens in the event of a crash. So I'm not trying to disparage anyone who does bespoke crates because there's some fantastic crates around. But I'm just these are just questions and things that arise. OK, so the don'ts. Rule 57, when in a vehicle, make sure dogs or other animals are suitably restrained so they cannot distract you while you are driving or injure you or themselves. If you stop quickly. As, so, you know, that's really important because um, in an impact, anything loose travels in the direction of the impact and it could act as a projectile, could injure you. OK, and that's the same for any packaging or anything like that. So you have to always make sure you have things strapped down and obviously they could injure themselves. <clears throat> a seatbelt, harness, pet carrier, dog cage or dog guard are ways of restraining animals in cars. OK, so this newspaper cutting is um, about a dog that actually jumped out of a caravan window on the M6. So why on earth the dog was just left in the caravan for the travel? I do not know. But anyway, they never found the owner and the dog actually got rehomed by someone who was probably a far better owner. But the reality of this is dogs do jump out of car windows, you know, and I've I've known dogs do it, you know, and I've gone tracking them. I've got a, a Springer Spaniel who tracks missing dogs. You know, the owner pulls up at car at traf, traffic lights and the dog jumps out of a window. You know, a few months ago, I was traveling down to take the dogs um, out for um, a walk and I couldn't believe it. And I thought the dog in in the car in front was trying to escape and because he had his like front paws on the side of the vehicle and the owner holding him and I thought oh my goodness and then they got up to traffic lights and I thought oh phew they'd be able to restrain the dog back you know they should have had the dog strapped in anyway and then I realized as they were stationary at the traffic lights that actually what they were doing was letting the dog do that and a very titanic kind of um movement and I was so shocked because I hadn't been shocked and I got out there and just you know given them hell because it was the most a horrendously dangerous thing I've seen to hold your dog out of the car so they can have the wind in their ears. Absolutely awful. And the same goes, don't let your dog stick their head out of the window. You know, last week I saw a dog walker arrive to walk their dogs with dogs with their heads out the windows. It's it is so dangerous because they can get grit in their eyes. And obviously it's also a risk that they can um, jump out. And, you know, even if they are restrained, they can still get hit by something as well. Now, ideally not in the front of a seat of a vehicle because they can be a distraction to you. But also you've got the issue of the airbags. Now, in full disclosure, <clears throat> one of my dogs does travel in the front of my van. It's my boy Rowan. He can't cope. I tried a whole load of different harnesses. Um, he can't cope with being in a crate. He's actually a danger to himself from injury. And there was... Um, the amount of times I was driving and he was all settled in the back. So I thought and then literally 
it was like a scene from Allo Allo, showing my age now, with, you know, the, the British airman and him just popping up in the front seat with, hello, and think, oh my goodness, and then I've got to pull over on the whole shoulder, get him secured again, and then travel off, so that's dangerous in itself, pulling over. Um, so he sits up front, which is very comfortable with. He's very calm. I have a diffuser in the front with, you know, I, I specialise in essential oils. So um, he's very calm with that. And I've got a dog um, in the back who actually gets a bit of travel sickness. So I have the different oil blend. So if you are someone who so struggles with that as a, well, either a human or a dog, because I get travel sick, do get in touch because I've got loads of um, remedies. Um, but yeah, ideally not in the front seat, but it's in my van. It's a big bench seat. He's actually safer in there than he would be, I think, in the back of a car. And there's no um, airbags for the passengers either. So that's something you've got to consider because obviously the airbags can injure you and you've got and um, they could actually suffocate your dog. You've got the front one. You've got the side one. They can do burns. Um, they could actually just, you know, quite injure your dog um, as well because they're obviously not designed for dogs. They're designed for humans. Um, <clears throat> no soft crates no soft crates and no collapsible crates. You know, I've got a crate in my lounge for my blind dog that's one of those lovely fold-up crates, but not to travel in, you know, because they will in, they can fall in on themselves. Even if you cable tie them, they're still dangerous in a crash. And, you know, soft crates especially, they can just, you know, your dog's just not safe. They're going to get squished. You know, I see dogs all the time um, in the boots, in crates or things. And, you know, that boot, if someone goes in the back of you, your dog's squished between the boot and the back seat and so I hate seeing dogs in the back I'd rather they were in the seats you know um it's it's just again it's just such a dangerous position and a partition isn't enough um so you know there's loads of places that sell these um dog guards but they're not fixed in very efficiently I've got an old one from Halfords that I have in my old Land Rover that I've fixed it in differently because it just wasn't secure and I don't really I mean my Land Rover goes about 25 miles an hour so it's less of a problem but it's actually not there to secure the dogs um primarily it was there actually for my rosettes but um, when we used to do flyball but it's actually not in a position that it's going to injure anything but it you know they only prevent forward motion and if you've got windows in the back of your vehicle the dog can still get ejected out of that vehicle it can still be you know, they can still get out the boot. If the boot opens or emergency services open the boot, they can still get out. So they're actually not secured at all. And the the um, the dog gate can actually just come loose. Now, um, manufacturer fitted dog gates, that's different because they're specifically designed for the vehicle and they're specifically bolted in. So that is different. But you've still got that issue at the back where you've still got that e exit out the back door um, or the boot and the side windows. So you know, it's really important that you recognise that. And, you know, like I said, these these um, dog guards, I mean, my one before I fitted it in was very loose. If we'd had a high impact crash, it would have just come, you know, it, they're not secure um, at all. Um, so it's really not, you know, they're really not a good um, idea. In fact, mine's so secured so well in, I can't even take it out even if I wanted to. So because I did, I did a pretty good job fixing it in. But um you know that's not how it it's not how it was designed to be fitted in um they're like those push um pressure ones fitments so a few things to think about doors and windows get damaged and a scared dog will run you know um i don't care what anyone says you know oh my dog won't leave me i've got dogs that have got really good proximity when we're out for a walk I can't guarantee that they're not going to get spooked. You know, I've had it. I mean, my blind dog absolutely is completely devoted to me, if you know Inca. But if she gets spooked, I've had it a couple of times. When we've been on a beach and she's been on a long line and something suddenly spooked her and she is off. And I'm having to run across the sand and rugby tactical, you know, kind of flying leap onto the end of the lead and pull her to a stop. You know, you can't say that a scared dog won't run and a scared dog will just stay with you because it's it's not true you know and doors and windows do get damaged um and potentially they you know they can get ejected from the vehicle they can get eject you know i see humans ejected from vehicles i mean i've had patients in that have been too large to fit in the ct scanner that have actually been ejected from a vehicle so there's you know and that you know there's no reason that your little 20 kilogram dog is not going to get ejected from a vehicle in the event of a, a, a crash at sort of you know at 50 to 60 70 miles an hour so don't think that that won't happen and then of course they can get potentially hit by cars if they they survive being ejected they can then get hit by a car and also emergency services may let dogs out and 
again, I can't tell you the amount of times that I've um, been in attendance of um, a casualty at, you know, it's coming from a crash and there's been a dog in the vehicle, dogs. And, you know, the paramedics are really upset because this dog's missing. And, you know, they were like, you know, we didn't know that we couldn't do anything. We had to get the, to the casualty. And, you know, it's something that didn't need to have happened. And the other flip side of it is, is a dog might be trying to protect you and be aggressive towards the, you know, the people trying to help. And, you know, that in itself can cause a problem that could delay your care. It could involve, if you know, in, in the case of a really aggressive dog, perhaps the dog needing to be shot or something like that, you know, if they're trying to save your life. So, you know, there's loads of reasons why you must secure your dogs um, as, you know, for that reason. And um, just to go on to this picture, this is quite a sad one. So there was this motorhome that was broken down on the harsh shoulder carrying 12 show dogs and the a lorry plowed into them. Now, the sad thing is that these show dogs, they survived the crash, but then three of them got loose, ran onto the motorway. Actually, I think four got loose and three ran onto the motorway and were killed instantly. And one of them was lost, but was later found. So you know, this is a pretty devastating crash, as you can see from the pictures, but the dog survived it and they got loose and then they were killed on the motorway. You know, what a waste. Um, you know, absolutely, you know, a horrendous crash, absolutely horrendous. Um, I always I always make sure you turn the gas off. And I was quite surprised, actually, when I got on a ferry to the Isle of Mull um, and the uh, the guy loading the ferry went as your gas off and I was like yeah of course you know and I actually what I actually does I bleed it out as well so um I will actually um turn it off and then I turn my hob on to make sure there's nothing in the pipes so because I'm just like super cautious and make sure you hydrate your dogs before journeys as well you know generally it depends on the dogs from my 22 kilogram dog I usually give about 250 mils of water a couple of hours before and then it's like you know every half hour it might be you know five laps of water and then make sure they've peed um because obviously traveling can um dehydrate them particularly if you have a dog so rowan can have a tendency to pant quite a lot because he get and maz can you know because he's he can feel a bit nauseous if i've you know i've got some great remedies for them now but this was certainly the case before and then they can get really really thirsty so really important that you hydrate them and obviously you may need to break your journey as well so you can do some pee stops um and give them some more um hydration make sure they've got a collar and a tag on um, because again if they get loose you know there's no id on them um and obviously there is a lot of dog theft around as well so it's important from that point of view that you know if they were missing and um you know they've got a, a collar on and someone can reunite them with you you um rather than just you know someone pretending they're theirs or something um it is obviously all about risk versus benefit and a balancing act as to what the best option is for you and traveling and that's what we'll we'll be covering um, more about. Um, always have a fire extinguisher as well. Um, you know, and again, just going back to risk versus benefit, all the information I give you, it will probably raise more questions. Um, have a fire extinguisher handy as well. I have one in the back, but I also have one in the front so that I can, you know, I can get one because again, having a fire extinguisher could make a massive difference in, um, you know, your vehicle you, you might be able to extinguish any particular um fire um a small one um before it actually takes hold so really important so travel safe so this is my beautiful boy paddington he used to travel everywhere with us to shows he was blind and epileptic and he was always at all our canning cross events and he'd be out on for a walk in my stroller um so he actually used to be harnessed in with the boys i used to have him in a, a travel crate but in actual fact what i realized which i'll explain later in the event of an emergency and i had to get out i wouldn't have been able to it would have been too cumbersome so i had him just with a harness um he's actually not we obviously weren't traveling and he isn't harnessed in at this moment in time because he's further forward but you can see the little um tether there that's where he would be harnessed to hanging at the back so he was he'd have been much further back rather than just chilling on the step um but he he was he was absolutely brilliant he, he'd go everywhere um <clears throat> but basically they must be secure you know again because you don't want them ejected you don't want them going missing in the event of a crash you don't want them roaming around the you know and potentially distracting you and it must be safe for their need um you know it's it, that's really really important as well i've got dogs with um different needs so i've got a blind dog i've got um a two-legged dog and i've got a paraplegic dog and so it has to be safe for their needs and it has to be comfortable i mean inca is on a bed on the floor rather than on the seats where the springers are because you know she's blind she can't see so she's actually in um an area with um uh sort of my um 
fridge and my toilet either side of her so she feels really secure um and she she's still comfortable she can move around and she's got a bowl there but she knows exactly where everything is and she can orientate herself really well she's she's pretty cool actually um and so you need to make sure that whatever you've got is suitable and make sure it's comfortable as well especially if you're doing some long journeys um you know i have um, memory foam beds for the dogs and um, for the springers, they're on my seat. Um, but for the disabled dogs, they've all got memory foam. And then of my two boys that can be incontinent, they have towels underneath them as well to to um, soak up anything. So they don't have, they're not sitting in wet urine or anything like that or poo. Um, make sure it's at the right temperature. You can get some really fancy, I have no bulkhead in my van, but if you've got a bulkhead, you can get some really fancy little um, thermometers that actually um, can give tell you on your phone what the temperature is in the back. So you don't, they're not very expensive. They're available on Amazon. They're a really good price. You might need to fit some fans. It's really easy to get fans to fit that just run over the 12 volt. Um, you know, but again, you might need fans when it gets hot, but you also need to make sure that you're not overcooling your dogs as well. And obviously make sure your dog, if they're in a harness or anything, that they're able to move within reason. You don't want too much forward travel. Um, my dogs can move probably about 20 centimetres, but they have, um, two of my dogs have, um, like to turn around quite a lot. So I actually have climbing carabiners attached to how I tether them. Um, which I'll explain about it about in a minute. But when they spit, they turn, it just turns with them so they don't get all tangled because otherwise their tether can get more tangled and their um, seatbelt, their harness can get more tangled so they can actually move. It's, I only need it for two dogs, interestingly, the others don't bother. And they must be secured to an immovable vehicle structure. So I have harnesses, my dogs are tethered and it's two proper tether points. And, um, you know, so they can't move. And that's, you know, so that's really important. So because obviously in the event of a crash, you don't want that bit of, you don't want to have your dog all nicely secured, but then the bit that they're actually secured to actually comes out and maybe hits them and moves and then they go flying through the window. Don't forget any loads you have must be secure as well. So, I mean, a lot of us, you know, obviously we go camping, we probably have got quite a lot. And I mean, I've got, when I go, I've got my stroller in the back and I've got Bambi's wheels and then I've usually got my matting, um, but it's all secured down with, um, cargo netting and carabiners and you know it's it's everything secure um so again this is something that you need to consider when you're traveling and it's not a case you can't just wedge it in it's got to be properly secured because again in the event of a crash it can come loose crash safe so <clears throat> these are the two dogs they're not strapped in we're not traveling it's just a cute little picture of them they're down route we've had a nice little walk and they're just curled up together it's little seren and bambi so cute so crash safe is it fit for purpose is it designed to be used in the event of a crash so not your soft crates not your collapsible crates you know what are your you know the harnesses are they designed to be used in a crash who tested it was there independent testing or did the company pay for it to be tested which is generally the case info on the vehicle it was designed for what vehicle was that crate really designed for because it's no good getting a crate that's absolutely superb but it was actually designed for a, a bigger or a smaller vehicle than you've got because it might not be um it fit properly and it's the same for the harnesses and things like that is it a good fit for your dog is it a good fit for your car because again this all comes in and have you got two or more exits into that especially if it's a you know for a crate or even just in the van so in the van i can get in at the rear door although my stroller is there but you know i can climb over it <clears throat> and get in my side door and i can get in the front because i've got no bulkhead so i've got three three exits um a crate has it got a removable back so that if the back's caved in you can still get your dogs out you know, that's really important. You know, if you're in another kind of van, can you access the crates? I always remember someone telling me um, they were in an accident many, many years ago and they couldn't get their dog out of the van. And I think there was a risk of fire and she she hurt her hip kicking the door open. Um, but she managed to get in and she said after that, she always bought a van that had the, a door at the side and a door at the back. She'd never buy one with just one, you know, one entrance or an exit. So it's really important to consider that. Even if you just have a you know panel that you smash through, you've just got to have that chance. So there's Inca. She's on my little um, seat. This again, we're, we're obviously not driving here. Um, and Paddings again, and then Evelyn insisting that she can drive, but she's a Springer Spaniel. So there you go. So harnesses, what to look for? Nice Y-shaped harness. Um, 
because you don't want it restricting the shoulders for exactly the same reason people say Y shaped harnesses for walking. It's exactly the same for traveling. You don't want it to be impacting on the shoulders because, in the event of a, a crash and then being restrained by the harness, it can cause injury. I mean, I see injuries from seatbelts anyway, but you know, it can literally just really be a problem. You, you want to have it um, so it's actually. Um, you know, nicely proportioned, particularly the breastplate as well, because again, you don't want it cutting into anything. Ideally with no fasteners, and you want a strap located close to the harness for the seatbelt to go through. So one harness that I really like, I actually have, um, has two, um, has a long strap attached to the harness and it has two loops. And I always put the seatbelt through the loop that is nearer the harness. So it's quite secure. So it actually can have a seatbelt through. It's a nice it's a nice harness. Then you can just actually sit them in. I, I actually really like the harness. But interestingly, it failed the crash testing because when it was tested, the people testing it put the strap through the loop at the back of the at the at the far the end of the loop, the strap. So that it, the dog was able to travel far forward, far more than was desirable and could fall right off the seat. But if they'd actually put it in the, the loop that was nearer the seat belt, it's a brilliant harness. So, you know, and I don't know what the, the rationale was for that because it's a it's a brilliant harness and it's a shame. Um, make sure it doesn't cross the shoulder joint, joints, doesn't constrict the neck. So, again, I was looking at a crash test of a harness and I think I'm about to be joined by my cat, Holly. I was looking at a crash test of a harness and um, it was one that passed, to be honest. But when I actually watched the video, I think it was the most appalling one because it absolutely throttles the dog there on the neck. And in my mind, you know, that's that's a huge fail. You know, that dog's probably going to end up with either strangulation or a potentially broken neck. Um, but obviously this is on a dummy. But, you know, a dog that's got a, a neck that moves, even worse, you know, it's got a trachea. It can be, you know, um, throttled. Um, obviously make sure they don't chafe because especially if they're traveling and you're traveling a lot and you're traveling, you know, sometimes the competitions are quite far away, especially if you're like me, you go away a lot. You don't want it to be chafing. So, you know, it, it's not such an issue with um, furry dogs like I've got, but, you know, certainly with the finer dogs, you, you want to be aware. And always make sure you've got a D-ring to attach a lead to in the event of an incident where you have to exit the vehicle. I actually have... Um, some little handles attached to all my harnesses with a loop on um, and they're just attached with a little clip so it's so i'll tell you about it in my evacuation thing it's so i can loop a lead through them in an emergency okay crates what to look for not soft i think i've, I've probably labeled la labored that quite a lot and not collapsible okay it's got to be a fit a fixed structure it's got to have an exit hatch has it been crash tested at speeds? So different speeds. So generally, when I was doing my research, they were all tested at like 40 or 50 miles an hour. And um, they were many of them were actually tested in a variety of collisions, but only in one vehicle. And they tend to test them in vehicles that have got great structural integrity anyway. So the question is, how is that, how, that crate going to hold up in a vehicle that doesn't have that same level of um, structural integrity? You know, <clears throat> that's really important to to recognize. Um, are they fixed into the vehicle by people who actually know the product rather than a DIY? Because, again, changing and not strapping in a crate or not bolting it in correctly can actually change how it behaves in the event of crash. Um, some crates are also not tested in a vehicle. They're just dropped from height and they're smashed into walls. So you don't have that same information as to how it's behaved in a, a vehicle. And obviously, it's not being tested with a dog in it either. Um, and is it the right size crate for your dog? Too big is too risky. Um, as well as being obviously too small because there's lots of room for them to move. Now, this is the um, crate that Inca came over from Romania in. And I'm not, um, it's a beautiful setup, the company that uses it. It's really, it's a really lovely setup. I, I really, they're really well cared for and very comfortable in there. But, and this is obviously a bespoke um, crate. It, it was really good. I had a good look around the vehicle. It was really nice. And I just want to sort of make sure people are aware of that. But what I'm going to say is playing devil's advocate, I can pick a lot of problems with this sort of setup. And this sort of setup is typical for a lot of transport, um, but also a lot of people who have dog sports and they have spoke crates fitted. And the thing is as well, when you start fitting things to the structure of a vehicle, you start changing how it will um, behave in the event of a crash as well. So that's important to recognize that you start changing and fitting something into what might be the crumple zone um, will affect that 
that impact then, that force is then going to be transferred somewhere else within the vehicle that may have catastrophic consequences. OK, so obviously I am being devil's advocate, but I just want to point out a couple of things. So it has lovely little um, food and water bowls attached to the crate, which is absolutely lovely for the dog's comfort. But in the event of a crash, they are cable tied on. They're pretty secure. But in, a, in a, the event of a crash, they could actually injure a dog because the dog could be flung against them. They could get loose and injure the dog. The other thing is the bars of the crate. Um, muzzle width. <clears throat> dog easily could get their muzzle caught in the crate or their legs and be flung. You know, you can imagine in a crate they're flung from side to side they could easily break a leg by being stuck through the bars of the crate and I'm not you know like I said I just want to reiterate I'm not picking this out um as a as a you know as a real negative I'm just saying these are some of the things that people need to be aware of of what can happen post crash safety um <clears throat> this is probably something that's not really looked at a lot um as I said, I was a flight attendant for seven years. And one of the things flight attendants do a lot of, not just serving tea and coffee, we are very, very experienced in safety and emergency procedures. You know, we had, um, you know, we have a training course, which I think it was three weeks at the beginning, just on safety and first aid and things like that before we even get onto the tea and coffee. And then every year we have um, safety train, you know, refreshers like three days where we just practice everything. We do emergency drills and everything like that. So we really, really, it's really honed into us <clears throat> and it becomes second nature. And this is really important because in the event of a crash, certainly a fire, you've got 90 seconds to evacuate the whole plane. 90 seconds, that's all it is, because that's what's predicted it will take before a complete fire takes hold. Now, I was on a flight once back from Orlando where we got um, a warning light. It looked like we had an engine fire. We had to return back. We had to dump fuel out into the, um, you know, at about an hour away and then return um, and we didn't know if we had an engine fire or not. And so I remember landing and um, it was a really, really heavy landing. And we'd, it was pitch black and we we're trundling down the runway at a huge speed, you know, and you could feel the pilot trying to bring the aircraft to a halt and just seeing all these fire trucks chasing you down the perimeter. And I was in upper class and I've got the patient um, patients, passengers opposite me going, are we, are we on fire? Are we on fire? Because they can see all these fire trucks. And I just had to start, I don't know, because I didn't know because of where you're sat on a 747. Um, on a, the 200, um, for, the, for those of you plane geeks like me. Um, but you, you couldn't see. And, you know, all you're doing is you're waiting for the aircraft to come to a stop and hearing the emergency um, evacuation um, signal, which didn't actually come to we weren't on fire. But all that time that you're doing it, you know, instead of you, you obviously you're concerned, you might be a bit of panic, but you're going through your emergency procedures. It's in your head. It's been drilled into you so much that when push comes to shove, what you're actually thinking of is what you're going to do, who you're going to get to help you, what the exit's like, you're going to get your door, who's going to, you know, what pay, what <clears throat> passengers might need extra assistance, how you're going to get your passengers that are at the door to help you with that. And you're going through all the emergency situation in your head. And it means that you haven't got to panic when you actually come to a stop and you've got to evacuate. And that's the same thing you need to do for yourself in a car is just have an idea. OK, because that can really make a massive difference. And this picture is actually of a crash. Um, it was the rugby club um, fire um, that happened. It was a fireworks night and the smoke all went across the motorway and there was a big massive pile up because obviously people couldn't see and I remember one um story with um a family in the car and they had two dogs in the vehicle and they got out and they had their car was on going to burst into flames because the car they'd gone into was on fire and they had to get the dogs out and they didn't have any leads and they put their belts and they were able to get the dogs out through the window um before the car burst into flames and it was just like you know it was just up, it was terrifying listening to them speak so always have a la a lead handy and i have like i said i have these handles on the back of their travel harnesses and my plan and it's not the best plan okay it's not the best plan but it's the one i've got i constantly reevaluate but i'm on my own i've got six dogs three of whom have got special needs and i'd obviously used to have a, a cat as well so i have the leads i have bambi in a pouch it was going to be bambi and paddington the cat in a pouch i've then got um run a lead through these hooks on their harnesses so that's the four dogs i've got them all connected on on a lead and then Maz under my arm, he's a two-legged dog, and then we get out. And it's the best I've come up with so far. Um, but, you know, it's just having that plan. 
um, and having them on a lead, really important. So this um, really sad story was it was a little dog and it jumped back in the burning vehicle. I don't know whether it was trying to save the child. It's a really nice story. But um, when the paramedics found, the, the fireman found the dog, I mean, the dog was literally very burnt and you know horrendously under the I just hope he died of smoke inhalation first but under the front seat of the car but they'd got out the dog had got out the child had got out and if they'd had the dog on a lead the dog wouldn't have got back in the vehicle so this is really important you may think <clears throat> why did it jump in a burning vehicle was it trying to save the child was it just trying to get to somewhere that it felt familiar you know, so have a plan and constantly, re, you know, reevaluate your plan. I'm always reevaluating, thinking, you know, and the other day I had another idea of, you know, I could actually wear my canny cross or my walking belt when I'm driving so that I can actually just clip my leads on and I've got hands free to then, you know, manage everything else. So it's just having this plan, you know, really important. And the other one I was thinking is, is having my um, a tether, you know, one of those screen tethers easy access not dangerous so it's going to hurt the dogs but easy access so that i can actually get us onto the you know the the embankment and put it in the earth and tether the dogs to it as well in case i've got to get back into you know all these little ideas are all important to have a plan okay so some take homes for you um is it is all about balance it's about travel safe versus crash safe versus post crash safe and interchangeable needs so rowan um, he is in the front and I'm happy with how he is at there, actually. But it was about the most overwhelming concern with him was about being travel safe as opposed to crash safe. Um, and then sometimes it's an interplay because I didn't have crates put in my camper van because at the time my camper van was done, um, I had a beautiful um, elderly dog also disabled at that point who was um, a sort of German shepherd size. And I would not have been able to get her out of a crate quickly um, and or easily to be honest um in the event of a crash so harnesses were the safest thing for them and in actual fact it's worked out to be the safest thing for all the dogs because i've got more disabled dogs now but you know so sometimes you have to you know think about how you're going to get the dogs out and is whatever you're doing with your dogs during your journey going to be the safest option for that too secure your dogs make sure they're secured while traveling and if you leave the vehicle as well have to get out of the vehicle make sure you have your leads handy um, and choose products that have a basic, have had a basic level of testing and are reputable. OK, really, really important. Um, do your research. Look at how they've tested it. Look at what vehicles they've had. You know, any company shouldn't mind you asking questions. OK, they should welcome it, you know, and don't stint on it, the money. I mean, I know sometimes it does come back to down to money, but, you know, with like child seats, um, you have to have them and it should really be the same for the dogs as well. So, you know, choose products that are, are good and try and don't make it about the money. Use the best product for your vehicle and your dog's needs. Always have an evacuation plan. OK, constantly reevaluate it. OK, and think about what needs your dogs have. So that is the end. I'm just going to stop sharing and then I'm going to come. Hopefully we've stopped sharing and we're back in Facebook and you can see me thinking should yes so um if you've got any questions hi becky yes it's going to be live on my page i will be keeping it on this page it is not going to be missing anywhere so it will stay here so you can share it um but like i said i wanted to do this because um i feel it's a really important topic for people to have um, because I do see so much inaccurate information and you know constantly people are saying oh no crates are the safest thing and you know as I've said not necessarily they are safer than harnesses you know it really really varies so do ask questions um, I will be checking obviously and I will answer any questions um, thank you Emma yeah it's all about the plan I'm a planner I like to and I think as well because um, I'm traveling on my own um, I have to have a plan because you know i've got six dogs i've got three special needs i'm you know and and even just if you break down you must get your dogs out of the vehicle because you know look at the story of that motorhome they'd broken down and there was a crash so you must get your dogs out of the vehicle and ideally you'd be able to limp to a, a services or something but it's not always it's not always possible. So I hope that's answered some questions. It's probably left you with more questions, but do, you know, do um, just think about things, 
have a bit of a plan, you know, think about how you can secure. There is always ways to secure your dogs and crates into something, even when you think you haven't got a secure point. You know, there is always ways <clears throat> an engineer will find one, a way to do it um, and just, you know, secure your dogs um, and keep them safe. So thank you for watching. Do get in touch with any questions. Stay safe, stay well. Enjoy your travels now that we're... Um, coming out of lockdown I will still want to be cautious and um take care everyone bye oh hang on I just sorry I just missed these questions let's have a look yeah it is it's a bit of a um I think you've just got to be really careful with what you did I mean I did loads of calculations with um my tethers um and had a real geek out moment and, and sort of had a had a real look um but certainly if you're using um a harness that's got a strap attached that's a proper one that should be better um and i've i actually because mine aren't in a seat belt in the back because they're on um the the seat um but they're fixed to the struck to the where the, it, they're actually on tether points that are fitted to the structure um i like i said i have carabiners that are attached to them but you get yeah, i mean good climbing i mean you know someone who's good at knotting and good climbing rope is a, is a good one if you're going to diy but obviously my carabiners are all climbing strength carabiners not the cheap ones they're the proper sorry it's holly um not the you know not anything fake but yeah it's um it is as you say i i usually work out between 20 to 30 centimeters to be able to move and again it does change um my smaller dog will have less because um, of how she's, you know, her size. So you, you do have to take it on, um, depending on the dog. So Bambi, the little dog, will have a smaller, he has a shorter tether than Maz um, because of his his size and how they're fitted um, as well. But it's 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 a different, it's a difficult one. It, it is all about, you know, um, travel safe and you know like i said in comfort as well um becky i've created my video um if he's loose yeah i mean i would um i'd probably recommend i mean if he's in crates it might be a bit too big for him it's because again it's just about how much he can move around i mean you know the there's the option of providing some padding on there might be beneficial you could get perhaps bumper pads that you might have in a child's cot you've again you've just got to check that they're secure so they can't sort of suffocate him or anything like that um but it might be that you need to put a harness in there so he hasn't got so much room to move um you know in and look at how it is so i prefer less movement but obviously still comfortable my dogs can all have a fair amount of shifting around in their seat but um they're you know they're obviously still secure um so again it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a judgment call but yeah you've just got to think about in the event of a crash how much room is he going to be moving around in obviously a lot more than your the your crate so a, a harness might and, you know as well i think i mean have you got something attached to them as well in the event of an accident as well so you can get them out and attach something to them <laughs> you know um i mean you shouldn't have anything in your crate that they could get caught on um and strangle you know and things like that um i mean a harness is probably a better bet you know if there is a if there is a risk like that i can't think of anything that would be in a crate that would cause a problem unlike you know at home my dogs don't have collars on at home you know a harness might be a better option but you know so i hope that's answered i hope that's answered your questions i will check back any other questions as well so thank you for, oh yep yeah, they're all travel with leads on brilliant no um the only thing i'd say that's actually interesting you say that about the leads and um i had an experience so <clears throat> after um there was an incident a couple of years ago with um i think it was canny crossers and their motorhome caught fire and um they had to get the dogs out and they had all the leads and they were able to get out and it panicked me and that's probably why you keep leads on them as well i mean i i imagine and what actually happened i got to the end of my journey and one of my dogs the dogs that spins she'd spun so much the lead had completely and utterly wrapped around her leg and was really tight fortunately thank goodness she was all right so my dogs don't have leads when they're traveling <clears throat> because of that but she's <clears throat> but i've only got two dogs she's the one that has the swivel carabiner yeah so i if your dogs as long as your dogs aren't spinny dogs like mine nothing wrong with that at all and again it's all about safety from an evacuation um so yeah nothing wrong with that at all um and a great idea 
um and but not suitable for you know for mine i mean my blind dog can have a lead attached to her um my seren spaniel can have a lead attached to her but my other two springers can't because they they're the ones that shift around a lot and again i've had um rowan he got caught um in on one particular occasion as well he's the one who's just woofed um with um a lead when i'd not taken it off as well so um fortunately that was an even shorter journey and you know it was like 15 minutes but that you know so yeah so it's just again for people about the keeping leads on your dogs just something to bear in mind are they dogs that are going to move around and at risk of getting it caught around their legs or the neck but um you know if they're not then absolutely it's it's well worth um well worth doing um and the only caveat is that, you know like i said just make sure that they're they're safe doing it but um yeah it's um it's like i said it's all about it is all about risk versus benefit but i think for me one of the scariest things is is being in an accident where there's a fire or something and just having to get your dogs out and again it's um you know that really scared me when i i heard about that um the couple that were in the motorhome crash that you know their their whole motorhome was on fire and they'd had to get the dogs out and you know it was just like wow you know um scary very scary um so if there's no more questions um yeah so thanks very much for watching and i will like i said i will check comments so do feel free if you're watching on replay or anything do feel free to comment and i will answer oh thanks emma hope it's helped um so hopefully it's pro oh i think the thunder's starting now you just heard my rabbit thump um locking oh becky let's have a look what what about locking the boot or crates fire yeah again um it's again i live in the city so i um i have i'm very worried about the doors being opened um at traffic lights and things like that and the dogs being you know for that reason and again i lock my doors so if i'm traveling on a motorway i actually turn off the set so i have the central locking but once i'm driving i turn it off so it's not the doors aren't locked because it's it worries me um that particular reason but but certainly i i agree i think um they you know again it's a bit of a judgment call bearing in mind where you live um we do occasionally get carjackings where i live so um i would you know everything would be locked for me um and you know again i mean if your boots locked do you need to lock the crates um it's torrential rain here sorry do you need to lock the crates as well um while you're driving um so again it's a bit of a it's a bit of a judgment call um based on you know your individual circumstances and sometimes it's, it's about adaptation i mean if i'm driving around town not that i do you know i probably will i will have it locked if i'm going on the motorway i just make sure everything's unlocked for that you know, for that very reason so it's it's pros and cons unfortunately there isn't a definitive um definitive answer but you've raised a really good you've raised a really good question so hope that's all right Rome will be all right in a minute i didn't I, honestly it was bright sunshine and there's now thick clouds so i need to go and get some uh, calming oils in the diffuser and get them all um settled but do feel free to comment and i will um i will get back to and answer any questions i'll just just check there's no one else answering questions so brilliant i'll end it now i'll go and down to my barking dog who's terrified of the thunder and take care everyone stay safe and safe traveling take care bye well i say i'm trying to end it i'm trying to end my live video i did this the other day facebook didn't want to end it so it's still not ending it. Yes, we're ending it.